At the University of Florida, I uh, had my first experience outside Christian higher education. Clearly, University of Florida was the uh, state university of the state of Florida and uh, the flagship school. And I had gone there to work on a master's degree, which was going to be a combination of education and music. Now, uh, what I didn't expect is to discover that some of my destiny, some of my future would be in non-Christian higher education and uh, in public education. But that's the way it turned out. Part of what I realized at the University of Florida was the uh, meaning of a land-grant university. Um, I was always under the impression that Christian higher education institutions would be oriented toward service in the church. And yet I found that uh, not all Christian institutions are really oriented toward service of any kind. And uh, at the Land Grant University, of which University of Florida was an example, uh, the emphasis on service was very, very strong. One of the things that uh, happened at the University of Florida was that uh, we were spending time in the communities and ultimately, when I became a faculty member at Florida, I was asked to be uh, uh, a director of the director of a program that they started in uh, Duval County, Jacksonville, to take the teacher education program into Jacksonville and base the student teaching experiences and the teacher the last part of teacher training to base it right in Jacksonville. Why Jacksonville? Because they had huge amount of schools and a huge amount of children there. And uh, the institution at that point had taken the stand that uh, it's time we get away from the laboratory school and the enclave schools that uh, serve most institutions as the place to train teachers and get out into the real world of where the schools really are and where the people really are. <clears throat> so what we did was um, uh, set up a program at uh, Duval County in conjunction with the local school district and uh, put all of our senior students over in Duval County for a period of time. Um, and uh, I was the coordinator for it. And uh, this, at the ripe old age, I think of then about 23, um, I took on that responsibility and it turned out to be a real delight. <laughs> but the most important thing was that we discovered what it could be when the university put its emphasis on working hand in hand with local school districts. Well, that program prospered and uh, ultimately, actually in the second year after that, uh, Pinellas County, another dominant county in the state of Florida, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, asked if we could do the same thing down in their county. And uh, pretty soon the program took off like gangbusters and was all over the place and became one of the two institutions in the United States, two universities in the United States, to transfer virtually all of its teacher training programs off campus and into local school districts. So I was part of that pioneering effort. Now, <clears throat> the reason for all of that was because the university at that time, the University of Florida, uh, had a very service-oriented view of its role in the society. And, um, studying with one of the key leaders of that movement, um, a man by the name of Norman uh, at the University of Florida, I really got into the question of the philosophy of a service-oriented university and how, what it would look like, what it should look like, and uh, became enamored of that model. In fact, when I looked beyond the University of Florida after a couple of years on the faculty there, um, I found that the only other place in the United States that was really moving fast in this direction was Michigan State University. And Michigan State said, well, here's an experienced guy from the University of Florida, a land-grant school, coming up to Michigan State, a land-grant school, and we're going to do the same thing in the state of Michigan. Interesting, the president at, the university, at Michigan State at that time was John Hanna, who was really one of the real brilliant men, men in higher education. And John Hanna had a commitment that the state is our campus. 
And uh, it became the university motto, and uh, it was his personal motto. And we did all sorts of things from the campus at Michigan State to, uh, to service the local school districts across the state, put teacher training centers in a total of, I think, 13 or 14 school districts, and quite literally did uh, a huge job during the time that Michigan State was the world's largest university, second only to University of Moscow. And um, it was a delightful experience working in that kind of work. My first five years with the university, I was not on the campus at all, except to come in for weekly meetings. Uh, my service was in the city of Pontiac, which is a blue-collar city, um, a General Motors city, and uh, a lot of folk that had very simple views in life. But uh, we did a job there with those schools and in Pontiac, and it was a delightful place to serve. And by the time five years of that went through in Pontiac, I was really keen on this business of university serving society in a direct contact way. Well, about that time, Michigan State decided they would broaden and uh, still further and uh, asked the College of Education to take on the responsibility of uh, working with the United States Department of uh, Education and also the uh, United States AID program. Uh, Agency for International Development, and we, uh, we provided a service to the nation, really, from Michigan State, in which we developed the ways and means by which universities of the world could become interrelated and could serve their societies more directly by working directly with the people in the contexts of their real world. And uh, I then shifted over from that work in the College of Education, Teacher Education Unit, I moved over to the International Studies Unit. And the bulk of my career then was in the International Studies Unit at Michigan State. And one of the very first assignments that I had was to work in, uh, in Brazil, where I met a man by the name of Paulo Freire. Paulo was deeply involved in Brazil, doing service work with the universities of Brazil toward the same ends and doing it in the some of the most backward and simple sorts of places I can even imagine in my mind. And uh, during part of that time, I spent with, uh, uh, with no shoes uh, in the back country of Northeast Brazil. And it was, a, it was a very difficult kind of service, but oh, was it fun. And we just had so much so much to do and so many people to, to work with. And it was an exciting period of time in my life. Now, <clears throat> Paolo I mentioned, <clears throat> Paolo Freire was a, a very brilliant man who had a um, very strong reputation in much of Latin America for being a literacy specialist. Well, he wasn't primarily <clears throat> educated as a literacy specialist, but he had become a literacy specialist because he realized that one of the first things you have to do in a, in a part of the world that is economically deprived is to help people learn to read and write. Now that particular motivation has been around for a long time and in general through the 19th and 20th century that always meant work with the children and get them to, to uh, able to read and write and they'll grow up and be adults who can read and write. Well, the truth is that that has never worked, never worked. The, uh, no matter who's doing it, whether churches are doing it, whether local communities are doing it, whether governments are doing it, it does not work. Because what happens is that if the children grow up learning to read and write in a society that doesn't read and write, children have no nourishment in the arts of reading and writing. Consequently, they don't have any support for it. They don't have any reason to do it. No, the adults in their community will simply suppress them right back into their ignorance. And uh, so this is what we discovered in, in Brazil was going on, and, and Paulo says the only way to do this is to work with the adults. So Paulo developed some techniques that were just very clever and very appropriate for working with adults, motivating adults to work in their communities, 
toward the establishment of literacy programs and toward the establishment ultimately of schools for adults. So <clears throat> the great movements in Brazil came out of that emphasis in uh, the uh, adult learners. And uh, much of my work at that time was working with Paulo's uh, teams in Northeast Brazil and uh, kind of learning on the hoof because we put it to AID this way. How would it be if Michigan State would send in a person or persons, several persons ultimately went into Northeast Brazil from our university uh, with the intention that they be participants but not leaders, trying to learn from the communities and not to teach the communities? That's just my cup of tea. So I went in there not as a, uh, not as a uh, power, not as a force, not as a leader, not as a uh, team manager, but I went in there quite literally as a, as a barefoot team member and learned how to work side by side with the Brazilians who were engaged in the adult learning tasks of many of the uh, very impoverished sections of Northeast Brazil. Well, through all that experience, I became very well acquainted with Paulo and, and very respectful of his service and his commitment to people and his commitment to uh, the role of, of higher education in the nurturance of community education. And uh, that really became his, his lifelong work and his career. And uh, it gave me great delight to discover in uh, a subsequent year that uh, the uh, Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation of uh, Sweden had uh, cited a number of people for uh, a, an honor to be created by the foundation and would we please come to uh, Uppsala, Sweden and receive our uh, medals. And uh, one of the persons on that first panel brought by the foundation was uh, Paolo and another person was me. Hard to forget. This was, this was something of Paolo Ferry's uh, life and his work in my life. And uh, it was a highly, highly prosperous kind of a thing to do. But it, it was just absolutely based in service. We did not do anything to get people to do things. We got people only involved with each other so that they would become more competent in being human beings in their local communities. Now, it raised such p political hackles that um, the uh, government of Brazil ultimately um, banished Paulo and uh, sent him out of the country for a number of years. And he went to uh, Switzerland and uh, hung out with some other people with like minds and uh, became really a very powerful figure uh, in, in that period, in his writings and his work. So there's a connection, you see, between uh, Jean Piaget in, uh, with the children of, uh, of uh, Geneva and uh, the game of marbles and um, the work with adults in communities of Brazil with Paulo Freire. And uh, I had a chance to be a part. And it was fun. <laughs>